Projection booth 101. Hey folks, everybody's got 20s tonight. So if you can make the change easier for me, that'd be nice. Like give me 22 if there's $12 worth or whatever you can do. Don't, I mean, don't feel guilty if you don't have it. But. 100 to okay, right? 100 to right? <laughs> <laughs> Two adults and one senior. Yes, sir. You guys take the front. Okay, I'll guide you a little. Get real close. Good, excellent. Just think of your secretary, Mr. Governor. Uh, yes. Brooke, fortunately, when he takes over here, he won't have to deal with any of this stuff. Nope. It'll be just all digital. All, okay. Good. So, how many years have you been running these uh, big boy Forty projectors? Years. Forty years. The middle part of the projector, here where the film passes in front of the light and behind the lenses and the sound heads have been in here since the mid 50s. Wow. And so it stops 24 times a second here in front of the lens. Um, and this is the intermittent sprocket that makes it do that. And the reason it stops is otherwise it would just be a blur. And since it stops that frequently, it flickers a little bit and that's why they call it the flicks. And then other parts have been added. Originally the light source was carbon arcs, which was two arc welding rods that you struck together to strike a spark. And they would provide the light and it had an automatic feed that fed them together with big retro, uh, rectifier set at the back of the units. And th those would only go for about 20 minutes, which is a 2,000 foot reel like this and so there would be six to eight changeovers in the movie from one projector to the other lots of chances for error i had to be here all the time um, so i added the longer arms like this and the six thousand foot reels which will run for an hour so most almost all movies only one changeover and obviously you had to cut a hole in the ceiling to do i this. had to cut a hole in the <laughs> ceiling when we added the so-called penthouse units, uh, which is a Dolby sound pickup. That was even later. Um, the red light uh, is, is the, where the optical sound is picked up. And that's when I had to poke a hole in the ceiling. Um, so they're incredibly uh, well-made and reliable machines. This uh, steel-lined projection bit. that's from those days yeah. that's from the old days when they were nitrate films and as a matter of fact they made uh, a lot of booths have toilets in them because the projectionist was not supposed to leave the booth the all the windows had uh, uh, curtains steel curtains that would come down with a lead shield that would melt to close that off the door closed automatically and the projectionist just died, <laughs> but but like that ch that changed fairly. Ship. That changed, I think, in the in the fifties or the late forties, uh -huh. and then later in the sixties or seventies, they changed to mylar film, and and we hardly ever have film breakage anymore since then. So, when was this theater built? Nineteen thirty-seven. Mm -hmm. So there was one set of projectors in here from thirty-seven to fifty something. I don't really know. Uh, and then these were put in here and I've been nursing them along and, you know, change the light source, change the sound pickup, the real extensions. So I, I'm going to thread this one up. I don't know if you want to see that. Here, here we go. So this is the first, first night that this film runs. And actually the, we're, we're doing a, a format change from flat uh, to CinemaScope, which is not as tall and wider. And so I've changed over the lens and the aperture plate here on this side. I haven't done it on the other side. I need to remember to do that. Mm. And so when it first comes up, it will probably be just an inch out, inch out of focus. Mm -hmm. That mad dash to get it in focus. Yeah, I'll be ready for it. So, yeah. And it may need a little adjusting up and down or something to, mm -hmm. to uh, get it perfectly on the screen. Okay, and then once it's threaded up, we, we run it a little bit. Just, 
and then we then we know that it's threaded properly. And of course, sound is half of what tells you, right? The sound of it, yeah. yeah when it's when it's sound. running, I run it by ear. Yeah. Uh, I know I know by the sound when something goes wrong. So I'm going to change this over. This is a flat lens here, what we call flat. Uh -huh. And it changes for the CinemaScope lens. And take the lens cover off. And then there is an aperture plate. That's for flat. So now this one is changed over. I raised it. I changed the lens. I changed the aperture plate. Good night tonight, I can tell by the crowd buzz. When I first bought the place, there was one speaker on stage, a, a bass speaker and a high range speaker, and 15 amps of amplifier. Oh my God. Oh, for the changeover, uh, up here, uh, there's uh, something that goes around with the reels and as it goes faster it spins as it the reel as the film on the reel gets smaller it spins faster and inside of that round box there's a little thing that hangs down with wings on it and the faster it turns because it's centrifugal force the more the wings go out and when they go out far enough they make an electrical contact which lights off the buzzer and the warning light, which is right here. That's some fairly basic equipment. And that gives me about three minutes warning. So when that happens, I start the other machine, I start the lamp for the other machine, and I start watching in the upper right-hand corner for cue marks. There's two sets of cue marks, hopefully. Sometimes they've taken the film apart incorrectly and spliced it back together and they're not there, but usually they're there. And on the first set of cue marks, I'll start the second machine, they're both running, they're both running, and on the second cue mark, I can, I can actually hear the splice go through on the second machine, so I know there's film there. I switch the aperture, which opens and allows the light and the sound over. And if I do it right, you can't tell. If I do it wrong, you might hear swearing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's a changeover, and it's scary until about the 4,000th time you've done it. <laughs> So but that's you, when stuff goes wrong, if it's going to. And, and of course, uh, when I was uh, working in here, I had uh, j just one time something went wrong, mm -hmm. which is, and uh, it happened to you too, where the, the reel fell off. <laughs> Down below? Yeah. Well, well, I can't better. remember which one. Well, I think it was the bottom one. Yeah, the upper one is a disaster when yeah. it falls off. It could damage stuff. Uh -huh. um, you know, every mistake that you can make has been made, and of course you tend to panic. I call the job hours of boredom and moments of panic. <laughs> I think that describes the projectionist job. Typically during a movie I'm either tearing down or making up the next movie or the previous movie, uh, getting them ready to ship. Um, so particularly with a foreign film it's hard for me to keep up because I can't read the subtitles. Mm -hmm. Otherwise I keep up by listening to the dialogue. So that's Projection Booth 101, 40 years cool. worth. That's cool. Yes, I can do that. Popcorn popping, look at that. Okay, this, I put this like this. Okay, starting seven minutes late. Got everybody out of the lobby. So now the lamp's running. I have the proper uh, sound format selected. I have the volume set for the previews. And I have the aperture and the sound on number two. I have the wake up buzzer on number one. And now we can start. And I'll bring the lights down a little bit. When I hear the splice go through here, I can actually switch it. There it goes. Click. And see, not much out of focus. Pretty good. I'm not even sure I can improve on it. I had the sound off in here, so I couldn't hear it. So now that one should run unattended for most of an hour. And then we'll switch over to the other one. And I love an espresso.
trash. The true romance. <laughs>